Welcome to the second video in the Leptin for Layman series. My name is Dr. Linda Blythe and along with my awesome sister Claire as Langle, we'd like to congratulate you on taking a step forward in reclaiming your health. Understanding about leptin can mean the difference between surviving and living an amazing inspired life and both Claire and I are passionate about empowering people to meet their amazing potentials. In the last video, you would have learned a little bit about hormones and how they work, what leptin is and how it interacts with the cells in your body. And we brushed on some of the diseases and disorders that are implicated with leptin resistance. In this video, we're going to go into how leptin becomes a problem and why, when it does, it can lead to a downward spiral of poor health. Also, why once you start going down the path of poor health, it becomes so much harder to regain the level of wellness you had at the beginning of the decline. From the last video, you will remember a major role of leptin is to let the brain know how much fuel the body has. You eat, your brain registers you are full, your liver and muscles store energy to be used between now and your next meal. So what goes wrong? The first problem that can possibly occur is that you miss out on a bolus dose of leptin at the start of life. Colostrum contains leptin and the amount of leptin you get in that first breastfeed is part of the communication between your mother's body and your brain. What it conveyed in those first breastfeeds helps you as a baby set up your cells so that the right genes are being expressed to help you survive in the environment you were born into. So what does that even mean? Let's look at two scenarios, the start of life for two babies born into totally different environments. Imagine a Bedouin woman goes into labour overnight and births a healthy baby in her tent as the sun begins to rise over the desert. Her diet would be naturally high in carbohydrates, grains, tubers and legumes, which would be consumed frequently throughout the day. The air temperature would be greater than body temperature during the day and much lower at night. The humidity would be negligible all year long. Meanwhile, in Alaska, a woman gives birth on a frosty morning in a snow cave. The sun is nowhere to be seen and will only make a brief appearance for the day. Her diet for the last few months has been almost no carbohydrates, but is very high in fat and protein. This would have been consumed in only one or maybe two meals each day. Throughout the day and night, the temperature would have stayed considerably lower than body temperature. The humidity would be changing quite a bit throughout the year. As you can see, these two babies are born into completely different worlds. Their energy requirements are very different, yet their genetics are virtually the same. What many people don't realise is that although we can look so amazingly different, human beings have less difference in functional genes than almost any other animal on the planet. Two individuals in a herd of zebras have more genetic diversity than babies mentioned above. Soon after birth, these two babies need to set up their hormonal systems to be able to express the genes in their bodies to cope with these two very different environments. Here is where the epigenome kicks in and receptors are laid down on their cell membranes. The first baby is going to need to be frequently consuming carbohydrates, the most available food found in that region of the world. Carbohydrates not only give energy, but are also converted into carbon dioxide and water. This metabolic water is just as essential for survival as the energy from the food. The second baby is going to need to learn to eat large meals and be able to go longer periods without food. Say in the times of blizzard when hunting seal would be far too dangerous and not likely successful. Not to mention how different these fuel sources are when it comes to how the body uses them. Baby number one is going to need to have the cues to eat often to maintain hydration and energy. This means that if this baby is too sensitive to leptin, the risks of dehydration become an issue. Whereas baby number two needs full leptin sensitivity to be able to go long periods between feeds, to use fat as fuel efficiently, and to be able to create free heat to protect against the cold. The amount of leptin and the concentration of macronutrients in these first breastfeeds from mum, as well as responses from the skin and gut via the nervous system, indicates to bub which part of the world they were born into and what they will need for survival. Most of us these days aren't born into either of these scenarios. We have an abundance of food, both high carbohydrate and high fat and protein. We regulate the temperature with heating or air conditioning and we regulate the humidity. Another thing that occurs is that at birth, not many babies are brought up to their mother's breast, and most babies certainly don't remain there for most of that first 24 hours of life. Some have no contact with their mums in this time and are fed glucose or formula, neither of which contains any leptin at all. All of these factors contribute to a reduced amount of leptin receptors being laid down in the cell membranes. 
When you reduce the number of receptors laid down, the risk of resistance is increased. This is just the beginning of how things go wrong. The next contributing factor is living outside of our circadian rhythms. With artificial lighting and bright screens, our bodies have less ability to differentiate between day and night. We will be going deeply into circadian rhythms later in the series, but understanding that we as a society are suffering from a night deficiency. A lack of night reduces the body's ability to allow leptin to cross the blood-brain barrier to signal fullness. On the same note, without experiencing the different seasons, the signaling for leptin gets confused. Not only the lack of change in temperature, but the constant availability of all types of food, all year round. Being able to obtain summer foods in the deep of winter or autumn foods in spring is messing with our hormonal signaling. Again, this is something that will be covered in full detail as we go through the series. The final contributing factor is the overstimulation of leptin release. As you already know, you produce leptin in the, your white fat cells and it is released into the bloodstream when you eat food. So the more frequently you stimulate the release of leptin by eating, and the more white fat you have, the higher the levels of leptin in your blood over a period of a day. If you are like the average person and have breakfast at 7am, then a snack at 10.30 followed by lunch at 1, afternoon tea at 4, dinner at 7 and then maybe some chocolate or cake in front of the TV at 9.30, that might leave you with 4 hours in a 24 hour period where you have no leptin circulating in your body. Doing this day in day out begins to wear out your leptin receptors and they begin to go deaf to the signals. This happens even faster when you have a large percentage of white fat. Imagine it like this, if you live in a quiet street in a country and you stayed in a hotel near a busy highway, chances are you would constantly be aware of the noise. Whereas, if you lived near a highway, you would most likely be totally oblivious to even the noisiest trucks as they went by. In the same light, our leptin receptors, under constant bombardment of leptin, begin to stop hearing the message, I am full, we have adequate energy on board to function well. This is called leptin resistance and it becomes a big problem. Not just because when you aren't registering a feeling of fullness, you are likely to overeat and always feel peckish, but when this signaling gets skewed, it sets up a chain of events that make life difficult and impacts your health immensely. When leptin resistance occurs in the hypothalamus, it begins the process of a very serious downward spiral. The hypothalamus is the part of your brain where your hormonal system meets your nervous system. What should happen when you eat is the leptin that crosses into the brain binds with the hypothalamus. This signals to the pancreas how much insulin to produce so that the body knows the percentage of what has just been eaten needs to go into fat stores and what can be made available to the cells straight away. Again, think of this as a bit like the fuel gauge on your car. If the gauge was broken, the prospect of running out of petrol meant that you died as a result. Chances are you would fill up constantly and avoid fun things like road trips. Most likely, you would even keep a few full jerry cans in your boot. Your body is the same. It knows you need to have enough fuel to perform all the vital functions, like keeping your heart pumping and breathing. If the message isn't getting through that it does have enough energy, it will start storing extra fuel and either slow or stop any non-vital functions, like libido or cell repair and growth. When we're breaking down faster than we're repairing, that's aging. When the hypothalamus itself becomes deaf to having too much leptin in the blood, the signals going to the pancreas become agitated. Hey pancreas, we've just eaten and I'm not getting much feedback from the fat stores. They mustn't be there anymore. I think we're in famine. You're going to have to produce lots of insulin. I want as much of this energy stored as we can. The resulting spike in insulin takes the sugars out of the blood and starts storing them in the white fat cells. When your blood sugars drop quickly, you begin to feel hungry and tired. Your brain is not getting enough sugar to function as well as it should. This storing of glucose creates more fat, and guess what? More leptin is produced the next time you eat, which is likely to be very soon. Think about this in the light of the common diet advice that's out there. It is something we will add to as the series continues, but this is one of the reasons why diets don't work and are rarely sustainable. Okay, so we now have insulin creating more fat in your body, but it's about to get even worse. Your liver can also develop leptin resistance. Under normal circumstances, the energy from a meal is stored by your liver. It sends 40% out to the muscles for them to replace their glycogen stores, and the other 60% is stored as glycogen and fat in the liver to be used up between now and your next meal. 
If it is in the warmer months, some will also be going out to the white fat cells to help with survival over the winter months. It is all perfectly balanced and keeps your energy up to what you need to do. Unfortunately, when the liver doesn't register the leptin release, it also panics. Less energy is sent to the muscles. Who needs to move around when you aren't even sure you have enough energy to keep your brain alive and your heart beating? The liver keeps as much fat within itself as it can, but with the excess, it needs to do something with it, so it is packaged up as triglycerides or cholesterol and sent off into the bloodstream. Things are really starting to become a problem now, but it gets even worse. The muscles also become leptin resistant. They begin to ignore the energy being sent to them. They realize that in order of importance, if the body is in serious famine, it is best that the liver store that glucose away in case the brain needs it later. So even if 20% of the energy in the meal you ate was sent out by the liver to be used by the muscles, chances are less than 10% will be usable. The rest will have to be dealt with by the already full and stressed out liver as it's sent back. When the muscles have less energy available to them, they fatigue easily and getting out of bed seems like hard work, let alone any sort of exercise. This becomes a spiral of doom. More fat stored, more leptin released, more insulin made, more fat stored, less energy, less movement, more fat stored, more leptin release, and it goes on. Can you see how leptin resistance is a major contributor to many of the most prevalent diseases? Insulin resistance and diabetes, obesity, fatty liver and heart disease are just a few that we have alluded to in this video. As the resistance to leptin increases, life becomes really hard work. Remember how as a kid playing chasey was a huge amount of fun and running around all lunchtime was a breeze. This is because at that stage you were still leptin sensitive and that is how life should still feel now. In the next video of the Leptin for Layman series, we look at other ways that leptin resistance affects your metabolism and why this is one of the most significant health problems in our modern world. Thank you for watching.